Great. Thank you all for coming here today. We'll probably be seeing more people coming in as the uh, hour progresses. We're very excited to have Noel Yinsky here to come speak to us at LinkedIn. Uh, we care a lot about data visualization and uh, making beautiful, impactful uh, designs. And so it's great to have uh, an expert in the field of uh, interaction design and um, interaction visualiza uh, uh, data visualization speaking with us. Uh, Noah is an author of, an O'Reilly author of data visualizations and an editor and contributor to beautiful, uh, beautiful visualizations. Uh, and so you can check out those books and um, hope you will enjoy the talk. Um, again, we're very excited to have him here. The talk will be about an hour long. We'll have a Q&A session and then a small break. And then we'll have a continuation of the talk with two extra segments that Noah will go into. Uh, and then he'll also be available for discussions after uh, the, the talk ends for anyone who's interested. Um, Noah is a, a consultant uh, in this field. And so uh, please join me in welcoming here. Noah? Thank you. So um, I think and speak and write a lot about data visualization, which is a field I sort of uh, stumbled into accidentally in grad school, as it happens, and, and accidentally wrote a master's thesis on uh, this sort of thing several years ago, and I've um, been thinking about it quite a lot. So starting with just a little bit of background, why visualization, uh, other than the fact that they're fun, visualizations are fun or cool or whatever. Here's an example. This is a, a set. Uh, called ANSCOM's Quartet. It's put together, um, ANSCOM is a, a, a statistician and intentionally crafted this, uh, this set uh, to show um, that data is, is deceptive if you, if you don't visualize it, that it's difficult to tell what's in uh, a set of data. So uh, the properties of this data set, um, three out of the four uh, series of data here, the X values are the same. Uh, in all of them, the Y values, the average are the same, the standard deviation is the same. If you were to look at this on a spreadsheet, or look at this with statistical analysis, you would find these to be very similar data sets. And then you graph them. And you get very, very different looking graphs from each data set, uh, very distinct. And so visualization uh, gives you some access into this data, makes, makes the data set accessible, but it, it lets you see what's actually happening within the data, and that's very powerful. It turns out that our eyes and our brains have very sophisticated uh, software built into them for things like pattern recognition, um, for things like detecting when there are pattern violations uh, and, and on, on a variety of factors. So there's, uh, in terms of position, in terms of skew, color, size, blur, shape, and, and a number of other properties. These are all things that we are, um, they're called pre-attentive properties. We, we, can, we can detect these very quickly when something is different, when something is out of position. And if you uh, leverage these well, you can design things where you can get a lot of information into somebody's brain very easily or very quickly. And if you do not leverage these well, you end up in a situation where it becomes difficult. You actually, your design works against you in terms of communicating that information to people. So uh, fundamentally, the brain, how we see is as actually we're doing um, not just pattern matching, but pattern violation detection. When something appears to be different, when something changes, we're, we're doing a diff, a visual diff, and, and seeing when something is different. And so when, you, when you're working with visualizations, what you're doing is you're putting trends on the screen. You're putting patterns on the, on the screen or on the page for people to look at. And what people are going to detect, what they're going to see, is they're going to see these trends, but they're also going to see places where you have things like gaps and where you have outliers. And that's where the interesting stuff is, right? Because if the trend is consistent, it's, it's predictable. There's no surprises there. But the gaps and the outliers are what you're looking for where, where the noteworthy material tends to be. So here's an example. Uh, I, um, I ride my bike. I, I buy some bike things online. This is from uh, a little bike shop in Walnut Creek, one of my favorite online bike stores called Rivendell. And um, they've actually since changed their website, so this is no longer a real-time example. But uh, it's a small enough shop that they don't have a ton of sorting. They have kind of broad categories. In this case, this is their page for things like tires and tubes and pumps and patches. And the sort order is reverse chronological, which is to say the newest thing that's in the catalog is at the top of the page. And that's fine if you're only looking for a small number, um, uh, looking at a small number of, of parts. So if you're looking at rear derailleurs, they only sell four different of them. And so it's fairly easy to go through and look at what the different options are. But if you're looking at something like tires, they sell them for three different wheel sizes. 
Uh, they sell, I think, 19 different tires. Some tires are available for multiple of the wheel sizes. Some of the tires are only available for one wheel size. Some of these are skinny little tires for, for uh, racing and going quickly. Some of them are big knobby tires for mountain biking, some of them for touring. And there's no way to sort and filter these. So you have to do serially, look at each example, click on through the page, uh, read the size, read the features of it. It was just intolerable. The, the, the data scientist and me couldn't handle it. So I built this instead. <clears throat> And uh, very quickly, it lets you determine what it is, uh, w which tires are of interest. So there's, there's a couple of, of factors going on here. Um, the horizontal axis is the width of the tire. The vertical axis is sort of this intentionally, ambiguously uh, named or un unnamed axis that goes from more burly to more svelte, which is sort of a toughness, weight, speed analog. Uh, and then the three colors, the black and the white and the gray circles, indicate the rim sizes. And only one of those is actually going to fit on your bicycle. So you can very quickly uh, filter out the colors of the dots that are not the tires you're looking for. And that gives you uh, an option to very quickly look in a, a smaller portion of this graph and you know, click on the dot or click on the tire name and very quickly go to the page and look at the three or four tires that might be interesting to you rather than searching serially through all 19 tires that are available for sale. So that long-winded example is just to say, with visualization, it takes seconds to isolate and to look at three or the four, maybe five tires that are interesting to you. Whereas if you present something in a list or, or in, in, in some other format, um, the work is not done for you. If you put this up in a graph, the work is done for you. The thinking has been done for you. And you can very easily and much more efficiently get to the information that is actionable, which is to say, in this case, buying a tire. Visualization gives access to huge amounts of data. If you have not seen uh, Hans Rosling, any of the Gapminder talks, um, TED talks, and some other talks that are on YouTube, go check it out. He's very good. And he, he talks, uh, he's a Swedish, I believe, um, uh, researcher um, who, who works on things like global health and population and, and, and this sort of thing. And uh, so he, he, he does these very long-term um, uh, visualizations where you're looking at four or five decades worth of data across the whole world and you're looking at things like how uh, GDP has changed over five decades on a, on a per continent basis or a per region basis and how that's affected things like infant mortality. So there's a lot of data when you're looking at tens of, tens of regions or hundreds of countries when you're looking at decades worth of data and these couple of factors. And, and he, he does these beautiful graphs, these beautiful little animated graphs in such a way that you can actually see what's going on. And if somebody were to present you a spreadsheet um, of, of, these, uh, of, of this volume of data, it would be extremely difficult to see what the trends are, to see where the patterns are, to see what the outliers are. Um, in this case, I can't remember exactly what this is, but uh, it, it, it's, worth, it's worth looking up his talks, not just because you're interested in public health, but because of, of the volume of, of data that he can present compellingly in a very short, um, a short period of time and with not so many pixels as you would need to present, you know, huge pages of spreadsheets. And he does that by, by sort of wrapping everything in a narrative, in a story. And this phrase, telling stories with data, visual storytelling, uh, the word stories has come up a lot in the last year associated with data. And we don't normally think of data and stories going together. It's come up a lot with visualization particularly. Um, and the reason for that, going back to the Rosling, is the story makes the data relevant. It tells you what to look at. It tells you what to look for. It tells you why this is interesting or useful, what to pay attention to. If you just give someone a spreadsheet and say, here's some data, you say, thanks. I've got some already. I don't, know what I, I don't really have a good place in my decor for this data, right? But if you say, here's some data. I've highlighted the parts that are interesting. Let me tell you what this means. You're much more able to absorb it and actually make some use of it. So this, the focus on stories is, is kind of taking it to the next stage. The first stage is analyzing it and understanding it. And then, and then this next phase is being able to share that knowledge. Because if all you can do is analyze it for your own use and you don't have any way to distribute it effectively, um, you're very limited. You don't scale, right, as an individual. You've got to be able to put it out into the world in a way that other people can consume it usefully. Incidentally, I do, uh, I do enjoy an interactive sort of a thing. So if anybody has questions or if I don't go into enough detail about something or if I speak too quickly, uh, raise your hand, yell, and uh, we will back up and, and take the first question. Hans Rosling, R-O-S-L-I-N-G. And he's on YouTube. Uh, he's given a couple of TED Talks. Um, totally worth checking a few out. All right. So uh, just briefly, concepts and definitions. 
visualizations, infographics, these terms are not actually well defined yet. There's still some flux and some debate within, uh, within the visualization community about what these terms mean. The definitions I'm going to give you are the definitions that are used by people whose work I respect. And I think, uh, I think they're pretty good definitions. So fundamentally, it comes down to um, the process of how you get to the data and sort of the density. Uh, I'm sorry, the process of how you get to the visualization and the density of the data that you're representing. So something like a data visualization, uh, in this case, uh, represented um, by Tableau, generated in Tableau, this was generated by software. You, if you wanted to change the data, if you wanted to update it, you can very easily make a little tweak and have the software redraw the whole thing. Uh, it's not particularly rich in terms of the aesthetics. No individual had to go through there and draw every line or plot every point by hand or with a mouse and illustrator, something like that. It's algorithmically laid out, and that's a useful thing because it means it does scale. Infographics are going to be manually drawn. And when I say manually, this is probably in Adobe Illustrator, not necessarily with a pen and pencil, but somebody literally had to place every pixel on the screen. And this does not scale. If you need to change the data, if you want to use a different data set, if you want to update it with the next year's data, somebody has to go in and manually make those changes. And so uh, the trade-off here, the, the value of doing this by hand is that you can actually do it in a very rich way. You can pay a lot of attention to the aesthetics. And in some situations, that's useful, but you're limited to tens or maybe hundreds of data points. You can't do thousands or millions or, 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 or you know, hundreds of millions of data points. And a lot of the work that we do deals with large volumes of data. So we're going to be probably more on the data visualization end of the spectrum and less on the infographic end of the spectrum. So this, uh, this briefly sort of shows the trade-off here. Um, on the end of my right, to your left, uh, is, is the data visual. Um, the high volume data visualization end of things, where you've got a lot of data and not very much aesthetic treatment. And then on the other end, uh, on your right side, my left side, uh, you've got a lot of aesthetic treatment that can be done, but you're very much limited by data. And that in the middle kind of doesn't really count. There's no, there's no good use case where you're spending a whole lot of effort on, on many, many, many data points. It just doesn't really scale. So the horizontal axis there is how much, how much effort is required manually in terms of, of, of drawing. The vertical axis is volume of either data or volume of beauty, of aesthetic. Um, the rigorous people in the audience will be thinking, you can't combine axes like that. You can't put beauty and data on the same axis. Uh, so the units on the beauty there are millihelens, which is to say the amount of beauty required to launch one ship. Classics majors in the audience are laughing now. OK. Different use cases for your data. Exploration or analysis, and then explanation or presentation, right? This is, a, this is actually kind of a fundamental concern because it's whether, whether you uh, know what you're working with, whether you're presenting it to someone else, or whether you're still in an exploratory mode. This is a little bit more of an exploratory, an analytical visualization. We don't actually know what the story is. So this is a curated data set. It's, uh, it's some football information. I don't have a lot to say about football, but some people think it's really interesting. And this is, a, this is an interface that allows you to um, uh, sort of pivot through these different properties and see some different things about the different teams and, and, and their relative performance. It's not a fixed story. It's not the story of how the team that won the Super Bowl got there because they were clearly in the top two or three in both offense and defense for the year. It's not that story. It's here's some data, you can explore it. So it's not, it's not uh, something that's ideally suited for telling a very specific story. Rather, it's something that, where you can give the data to an audience and say, here's some data, play with it, enjoy it, make of it what you will. So that's much more the exploration, the analytical end of things. When we want to go to explanation or presentation, there's a story to be told. We know what the answer is, and we want to present this to somebody else. So this, this happened this week. Uh, the iPhone, total revenues of the iPhone, more than all of Microsoft. That's an interesting story. This is not a sophisticated data visualization, but it's very compelling, right? Because there's a story in it because it's a very compelling story. And so we don't have to do a lot of fancy treatment with the graph. I'm not sure what else you would do. It's only two numbers. But it's, uh, it's pretty interesting. So this is not spreadsheets. This is not quarterly reports. This is not revenues and margins. It's just, look where we're at today. My, how things have changed. Um, it'd be interesting to put you know, all of Apple's revenues versus all of Microsoft's revenues 10 years ago. You could do that. There's a lot you could do with that. But again, these are all very much in the, in the presentation. You're explaining something. You're presenting an answer to some people rather than saying, here's some data. Enjoy some data. Play with it yourself. Finally, education and persuasion. These are very different. But they won't tell you that if they're trying to persuade you. 
They'll say, we're trying to educate you. Uh, so here's a graph, sorry, uh, um, an infographic. So I would call this, this is much more on the education end of the spectrum. There's not necessarily a political bias here. There's not necessarily a point of view that's trying to be put forward other than, hey, look, Burning Man's kind of interesting. But there's not a particular bias or political agenda that's going into this. Contrast. This is a um, uh, diagram of the uh, House Democrats' proposed health care plan. I don't remember exactly which version, if this is what passed or not. And you think, wow, that's pretty miserable. And then it's very interesting, if you look right down here, the source says Joint Economic Committee Republican Staff. This is not a document that is meant to educate. This is a document that's meant to persuade. And when that, when that switch happens from trying to educate to trying to persuade, really different design choices get made. Really, really different design choices. You could spend a half an hour, and I have, uh, talking about all the very intentional design choices, the huge amount of effort that went in to making this look like it does. And the way that it looks is really painful, really difficult, really obscure. There's a whole lot going on. Um, uh, I'm, you know, the consumers are all on one side, and my doctor's like completely on the other side of the diagram here, and like the whole federal government's in between. Um, every design choice made in this was made in such a way as to make this whole proposition seem overwhelming. And uh, so it's not about education. It's not about providing knowledge to people. It's about advancing a particular point of view. And that's a choice that, that an editor or a designer can make. Um, and there are situations where that may or may not be valid. But uh, understand that that's an intentional choice. And that's very different from a piece where the information is just being made available. So that was just a little bit of definitions. Let's talk about how to do this, how to design. It's really simple. Like everything else in life, all you have to do to succeed is make good choices. In this case, I can tell you how, though. Fundamentally, what it comes down to is making intentional choices. Because what happens is when you're, when you're designing something and you use all the same defaults, you're not intentional about the choices. You're just sort of arbitrarily picking some things. Let's use blue. It's the company color. Let's do a timeline. We always do a timeline. Um, you miss out on the opportunity for some depth of consideration. And you miss out on the opportunity to reveal things of particular interest within a data set. You miss out on the opportunity to customize what it is you're presenting to the audience that you're presenting it to. And all these things matter quite a bit. So there's three main inputs that are going to guide these choices, these intentional choices that you're going to make as, you are, as you're designing your data visualization. The data itself is going to have some things to say about how it should be represented. The audience that you're presenting to, the reader or the customer or your boss or your team, absolutely is going to influence what it is that you're going to represent because they're all going to have different needs, different biases, different vocabularies, different time uh, available to them to read what it is you're giving them. And finally, you as the designer are going to have uh, a reason, a motivation for putting something together, for building a tool, for, for building a visualization. And that's going to obviously influence what it is that you're going to communicate. So we're going to talk about these inputs. First of all, let's talk about you. This really is all about you to begin with. Why are you here? What are your goals with this visualization? Uh, it might be that you're just exploring the data, and that's fine, perfectly legitimate. But as soon as you go to communicate it with somebody else, there's probably something in it that you want to show them. Because if there's nothing interesting in the data, there's no reason to show somebody else, right? But as soon as you say, oh, I'm going to show, take this down the hall to the person in the next cube, the person over there, and I'm going to share this with them, there's usually a thing you want to communicate. There's something of interest there. You have to understand what that is, what you want to get out of this interaction you're going to have with them. If you don't know what it is that you're trying to communicate, you have a very difficult time being successful in that communication. That's pretty fundamental. You have to know what it is you're trying to achieve if you want to be able to get there. So the type of information product that you're creating is going to vary a little bit depending on the focus. If, um, if, you, are, if you are doing the purely, I'm going to present knowledge to somebody else, uh, it's really not about me as an editor. It's not about my point of view or my bias so much. I really just want to convey data to somebody else. That's going to be this leg here on the left between the reader or your customer or your audience and the data. You're providing basically an informative product. If you do have a personal bias, a point of view, something that you uh, uh, want to advance, a political agenda, whatever it is, and it's more, about, it's more about conveying that point of view, maybe with using the data to support your point of view, that's a little different. That's going to be this persuasive arm, the right leg of the triangle here. 
where it's you and your relationship with the reader, which is the motivating relationship. Finally, if you kind of don't care about your reader or your audience or your customer and you're just doing cool things with the data, that's the foundation of this triangle here, we call that art. And that's not a bad thing. But be really clear that uh, when, you are, when you are creating art or when you're choosing to exclude your customer or exclude your reader, you're not expecting them to get the same thing out of it as maybe you put into it. You're not expecting a specific message to be conveyed to them. You're just having fun. And there's some beautiful, beautiful data art in the world. I'm not saying this is a bad thing at all, but I'm saying it's a different pursuit than either putting together knowledge that you want to convey to somebody or putting together an opinion or a point of view that you want to convey to somebody. So your audience, let's talk about them. They have needs. You need to satisfy those needs. In fact, if you don't satisfy those needs, you are going to fail. It doesn't matter how brilliant you are, how magical the encodings you choose are, how great the layout is. If your audience looks at it and says, I don't get it, it may or may not mean they're stupid. And that's valid. They can be stupid, but you still failed. If I'm up here and I've got this brilliant talk and I'm giving this brilliant talk to an audience and I'm speaking a language that none of you speak, I'm not a very successful speaker regardless of how good my content is. There we go. So your success, it's defined by the success of your customers. People don't want a relationship with your brand. They're not curious about your process necessarily. They want to get their work done. And if you can provide tools for your customer to get their work done, that's going to make you look good. That's pretty fundamental. If you can't satisfy their needs, if you can't help your audience be successful, then you're the one who's failing. And if they're doing it wrong, if they are unable to achieve success with the tool that you're giving them, um, you can blame them or you can fix the tool. So see the earlier uh, slide about iPhone and Microsoft. So how do you make your users happy? You actually have to understand who they are. Odds are very, very good that they are not like you. And that's a very difficult thing and that's been a very difficult thing to understand in technology and in design for all, uh, all of eternity, or at least all of the 20th century, where the people who have the tools and the insight to create new products, to create technologies that are going to be used out in the world, are not the people who are using them, by and large. There was a, a, a famous sort of cranky uh, exchange about two, two and a half years ago. Um, I think it was the CEO of 37 Signals, uh, so 37 Signals makes, uh, some of you know this stuff, uh, Basecamp and, and Backpack and whatnot, and they make um, online tools for software development to manage your projects and this sort of thing. And the CEO posted this sort of ranty blog post about, I don't know why people care about user research and user experience. Like, it's, it seems all very unnecessary. All you have to do is just design good things, and then people will use them and be happy. And, and really, come on, guys, how hard is it? And, and, and the entire user experience community kind of got their panties in a twist and wrote angry blog posts back saying, uh, you fool, you're, you're blind to the fact that you're in this privileged position where your customers are just like you. You are a software developer who is writing tools for other software developers use. Of course you know what they're going to like. You know what their priorities are. You know what their biases are. And, and that's a very special position, but most people are not designing tools for people who are just like them. Um, if you've ever used a microwave oven, if you've ever remember VCRs and tried to set the date on a VCR or a digital clock or anything, it was designed by somebody and probably members in this audience say, oh yeah, VCRs, no problem, I got that. I can do it with my eyes closed. But, but most people in the world are not going to be successful in those domains. And it's not because they're not smart. It's because they're just not interested in spending those brain cells to learn how to program VCRs capably. They have other things to do. So if you want to be successful in regards to these audiences, understanding them uh, is, is very powerful. And that includes political identity. It include, includes uh, uh, languages they speak, the jargon that they use. Uh, it includes how much time they have to understand what it is you're trying to present to them. It includes um, uh, whatever bias they bring to this conversation that you're having, their, their, their sort of uh, context, their, their frame of use. All of this matters enormously. We'll talk a little bit more about interpretations later on. So um, just for this audience, we can think of, uh, here's a variety of different um, audience members, customers for your data or your product or your information. Um, all of these audience members, a data scientist, a developer, someone in marketing, a potential investor, a member of the general public, if you're talking about the company or the product that you're working on, all these different members of the audience are going to have different parts of it that they're interested in, right? The investor probably cares about what your like, you know, five-year plan is in terms of being profitable, and the member of the general public wants to know how it's going to like help them be better. The data scientist might ask, you know, what, well, which statistical models are you using to, I mean, everybody has a very different interest. 
And you can give them all the same report or the same conversation about what it is you're doing, but if you want to be successful, you're going to tailor those communications to the different people you're talking to. Pro tip, this also works well for humans. The conversations you have with your mother, with your partner, with your children, you're going to use different vocabulary with your boss. Um, it works better when you actually customize the communication for who it's for. Finally, the third leg of the stool uh, that's going to influence your design is the data itself. The data has properties, and the properties of the data are, are hugely going to influence how you want to represent that, uh, those data visually. So going back to my lovely bike tire example here, it's got a number of interesting properties. Uh, it's got the wheel size, so we measure it with numbers, but it's actually categorical, right? There's only a small number of different size wheels you can get for a bicycle. So even if they are measured in numbers, I can't just arbitrarily pick any number out of the whole set of numbers and say I want a bike wheel in that size. There's three or four on the market that are relevant. So that's, that's a categorical slice of data. The width of the tire, on the other hand, is pretty much continuous numerical, anywhere from like 19 to probably up into the 65 millimeter range or something, right? And if I want to go out and buy a 33 millimeter tire or a 26 millimeter tire or a 47 millimeter tire, somebody's going to make one about that wide. So that's more or less continuous numeric data. We're going to treat that very differently from the categorical data of how big is the wheel. Um, price, probably also more or less continuous from, you know, 15 bucks for the cheapest tire you can buy up to probably, I don't know how much expensive bike tires are, more than 75, I'm sure. So again, that's continuous. You can probably pick a sort of a price range and find some tires within that range. And then the tire's going to have a couple of more properties, whether it's got some anti-puncture treatments, whether it's foldable and you can stick it in your backpack, or it's got to stay in a big size. So these are more sort of binary properties, and we could break them down a little bit. But there's a variety of different flavors of data, and you're going to use different properties to encode them, ideally, if you want to be successful, which you do. So we've had all this conversation about why we're here, what our goals are. We've understood who our audience is and what their needs are and what we have to do to support them so that we look good. We've understood what our data is uh, and how that's going to work. And so now we can actually start designing. I haven't talked at all about data formats yet, putting anything visually on the page. We're still, all this has been co data collection mode. So we're going to start by looking at our statement of goals. So show the sales figures. That's kind of OK. It's not a great, a great goal. Um, it's a little ambiguous. It doesn't give us much to work with is the problem with this. So we're going we're to veto that and move to something a little more detailed. So a goal like this, show the sales figures per product per region for the last 12 quarters, this is very specific. And in fact, what this is is a miniature specification for what it is that we're going to draw. It tells us what data we want to include. It tells us what relationships we want to have represented among that data. It implicitly is telling us which data we're going to exclude because that data is not mentioned because maybe we've got a lot more data than is listed here. It provides some boundaries um, around how much we want to use, right? Uh, so this is saying we're only going to look at 12 quarters. We don't want to look at all of history. We're only looking at this at the regional level, maybe not the zip code level or the state level. So we can exclude some information there. And this is all very powerful, both what you're including and excluding. The problem with, with, uh, uh, that we get we get sucked into, we get seduced into very often, is we want to show all the data. We've all been taught, show our work, show everything. And it's cool if you've got more data, right? You've done, you've done more interesting things, you've got more to show. The problem is more data is indistinguishable from noise if it's not the data your audience cares about. And the more points you put on the page that aren't the ones they care about, the longer it's going to take for them to find the ones that they do care about. So. Uh, Reducing the amount of data that you represent is a, is a really powerful technique to get to clarity. Um, sometimes slicing it and doing three different visualizations that are all related but different can be much more powerful than trying to lump all of that into one, right? You can have three clear graphs or one muddy one. So uh, a good clear statement of goals will help you make these choices, filter what you're going to include and how you're going to represent the relationships in that visualization. Define the desired knowledge before you pick a structure. This is kind of a fundamental, uh, again, fundamental design skill, whether you're writing software, building a house, whatever it is, designing a data visualization. You need to know what it is you're building before you pick the shape of it. And um, here's an example. So this is a series of donut graphs, which are basically pie graphs, but they're missing the part in the middle where you can compare angles. And so all you're stuck with is uh, little arc lengths around the outside. 
as individual donuts go, these actually are pretty okay because they, they're showing uh, a relatively small number of segments, which is fine. We're not looking for a ton of precision. And, and the differences in size are sufficient that it's pretty easy on any one donut to see what the rank is. Um, so this is, is uh, uh, different usage shares for, for email clients, desktop, mobile, webmail. So if we're only looking at one, it's kind of okay. And they've got the numbers there anyway, so I can just look at the numbers if I really care for that level of precision, so that's fine. But it's not just showing us one little segment. It's trying to show us how things change over time. And it's showing us how things change over time. This is a miserable, a miserable visualization because it's very difficult to compare those arc lengths across many circles. So if I say, uh, is the arc length in the May 2011 or the September 2010 donut larger? Well, the easiest thing is just to go read the numbers off the side, right? And at that point, forget the visualization. You might as well just put this stuff in a spreadsheet. Um, and the problem here is not that these are numbers that are impossible to show changing over time. It's that this is a format that isn't about change over time. It's about comparing slices of a whole, one discrete whole, and instead we're looking at seven of them. What they wanted was the maybe aesthetically less interesting but much more practical line graph, which is a great way to show data changing over time. And now if I say you want to compare, uh, show me the month that had um, the highest usage of the webmail clients. Well, it's right there. It's obvious. It takes no time at all to find that. There's very little comparison that needs to be done. And that's because position, that height, um, is a property that we're very good. We're very, very good at detecting and seeing subtle differences in. It's wired into the brain. The software is there from birth. It's not something we have to learn. It's not something you can teach or unteach someone. It's just there. And so this is a format that leverages that. It's not causing us to, to attempt to mentally transpose and compare little arc lengths, which we don't have built-in software to detect. And so we've got to sort of brute force those. This is built in. And so uh, by leveraging it, you get a much more compelling, a much more effective information product, although it may not be as aesthetic. Uh, and I think that was the issue with, with what had been done in the previous example, um, is they were told, make something interesting and aesthetic rather than make something useful. Those are very different goals, and you end up with very different products. Finally, the topic of appropriate encodings. This comes back to the data flavors. I'm not going to go through these again, but just a reminder, the data itself is going to have different properties. And this is very much like a database spec, right? You need to know what your different data is that you're building your containers for. In this case, you need to know what the data is that you're using um, uh, visual properties to represent. So uh, is this, can people more or less read this? You don't have to be able to see all the details. The, I put the URL huge at the bottom here. You're intended to click on that URL or go to, that's my blog, and there's a PDF of this graph. That's one page that you're supposed to print out and like tack up in your cube. So this is your shortcut guide to um, uh, selecting good visual encoding. So the, the URL is complexdiagrams.com slash properties. I'm not the first person to draw this table or a table like this. This one's one that I drew, but there's been many versions of this historically. The goal of this table is to help you match up a data type and a visual property that represents that data type well. And so what we've got is the, uh, a couple of columns that discuss the properties of, um, of the visual encoding, two main factors of it, whether it is naturally ordered in our brains and how many useful versions, how many useful uh, uh, increments or useful variations of it can we actually perceive and work with. And that combination is going to map very nicely to, uh, to a data type. So um, just to pick a couple off the top here, position or placement, is it ordered in the brain? Yes, absolutely. And again, this is not something that's learned. It's not something that you can teach or unlearn. Absolute placement and things related to that, like height and length, deeply, deeply hardwired into the brain. And we can detect very, very small differences. If you put a, a page layout uh, in front of somebody uh, and they'll say, how come that picture is two pixels further to the right than all the rest of them? Like people will see these tiny little increments and the resolution, the difference that we can detect is very small and the number of useful variations is like how big is your screen and how high res is it, right? You can have a very high number of useful, uh, useful small incremental differences on a, on a big enough screen with position. Moving down the chart a little bit, something like angle, yes, angles are naturally ordered in the brain. We can rank them, but we're not as good at detecting fine differences, right? So on a clock, five minute, five minute uh, uh, differences, no problem. But 
one to two minute differences, if the hands are just sort of arbitrarily floating out in space, we might have a little bit of difficulty either comparing which one's, which one's uh, greater or, or what the difference is. So that one has maybe a medium number of useful values as opposed to position which has a much higher number of useful values. The lower half of the graph, um, sorry, the lower half of the table uh, is visual properties that do not tend to be ordered in the brain. So things like shape, things like pattern and texture, things like um, uh, lines being solid versus dashed versus being dotted. These are very good for things like category and relational encodings, but not good for quantity or for ordinal encodings because they're not ranked in the brain naturally. There's not a natural sequence where if you give someone a dashed line and a dotted line and say which one comes first, th that mapping doesn't exist. We can, we can make it up, we can pretend, um, but that's something that has to be taught and has to be learned. It's not something that you can depend on every audience member just knowing. So uh, we'll come back to this. There's one more example here that I'm gonna put, um, put to you to think about for a little while, and that's color. So we're not talking about brightness, we're not talking about saturation, we're talking about color cycling through the rainbow. And the thing that trips everybody up is color is not ordered. And we'll talk about that in a little more depth, but uh, I'm gonna prime your intellectual pumps with that right now. So to map visual properties onto data properties um, is a little bit of a tricky thing, and that's what the table is there to help you decode. And, and it was summed up so beautifully last summer by Moritz Steffner, who's brilliant, uh, and, and does the same sort of work, this, this visual encoding and, and, and data visualization. And he said, position is everything and color is difficult. And I was like, oh man, like, that's, that's like half of visual encoding in six words. So I've been using this slide and quoting him since then because it's such a beautiful summation. And we're gonna unpack both of these because they're both uh, really important and really powerful to understand well. So position is everything. If you looked back at the chart, which I've now conveniently moved off of, you see that, that position, spatial placement, can be used for um, quantitative things. We can tell if something's twice as long or twice as far along a path as something else. We can use it for ordered things, ranked first, second, third. We can use it for relational things, things that are clumped or grouped together. Um, uh, uh, and, and categories, like there's lots of things you can do with spatial placement. It turns out that placement is um, more or less the most powerful visual property because you can use it to encode any kind of data effectively. It maps well to all of them. That's why position is everything. It's very powerful. Using it well is incredibly, incredibly rich and useful. So does anybody use Hitmonk? Okay, so like everyone but the six of you who have raised your hands, if you're planning airplane flights and you're not using Hitmonk, you're causing yourself a lot of pain that you don't have to. Hitmonk is like the best thing in the world, and I do not say that lightly. Their interface is magic. They are really, really good at leveraging the visual design to convey knowledge. So it's pretty simple. It's like, okay, there's some flights and they, they take off and they land and they're color coded by airline and there's some prices and it's, it's not actually exactly sorted by price. We'll talk about that in a second. You'll notice that all these flights, there's no numbers associated with the flights. Like there's a timeline across the top, different time zones, east and west coast, because that's the, I've got a Seattle to New York flight, so there's two time zones here. But the flights are not listed. There's no information about when they take off, when they land, how long the flight is. You don't need that. You can see which one's longer. You can see which ones have a stopover, which ones take off first, which ones land first. Like it's all very clear. So here's how much information is spatially encoded with no digits displayed about these flights. Now, when you mouse over a flight, when you click on a flight, you can get all the details that it's 8.47 that it takes off and that it's a two hour and 16 minute flight. The details exist, they're there when you dig into it. But they don't need to present that at the first level. At the first level, you care about, well, I don't wanna to get to the airport before uh, a flight that you know, is gonna leave at 10 o'clock in the morning. And so you can just mentally slice off those flights. You can also see actually that these, they've got these, uh, these little black arrows at the top corners here, and those, are, those basically act like theater curtains, and as you pull those narrower, it just chops off any flights that it touches, so you can very quickly focus. But, but fundamentally, what they've done is they've done great things with the placement, with that horizontal placement of the flights, so you can very quickly and easily compare the duration, whether or not there's a stopover, time of day, all the sort of thing. In fact, they've done such a good job with that that they've got room now to use their vertical axis for something else entirely. They don't have to sort, for example, by time of day vertically. Instead, they have a, an axis they call agony. And that's a combination of time of day, length of trip, 
price, number of stopovers, all these things. Um, and it's a really, really useful sorting, actually. And they have the luxury of adding this extra value because they've done such a good job with the rest of the encoding that they've got this whole extra uh, access to use, right? They, 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 they're very cleverly leveraging that, that vertical placement for something other than like time because it's already been well done. So um, position well. We'll talk about axes quite a bit later. Oh, we'll talk about axes quite a bit now. Um, so axes are great. They give you information for free because all the shapes, all the, all the data points uh, in your gallery are going to inherit properties from the axes. So um, I used to do this with the United States map, and then I gave a talk in Canada, and so I switched up the map, and, and now it's kind of fun to have a Canadian map. So uh, first of all, if I'm looking at these various shapes, I could have lots of notes or text or something in them saying this one's more to the north, and this one's kind of in the central, and this one's in the south, and more. No, I don't have to label them at all in that way. The axes tell me. That if it's up in that corner, it's on the northerly end of that one axis and on the westerly end of that other axis. And lo and behold, I don't have to label that shape or that province with those properties. It works the other way around too. If I know that I'm looking for something in the east, I can ignore the whole western two-thirds of that map, right? I don't have to look at those. The axes tell me this is where the thing I'm looking for exists. And so uh, you get information sort of both, both, both um, about the property Sorry, you get information about the properties of the object and, and also tells you which objects you're going to look for that have those properties. So really powerful. Uh, it, it breaks my heart every time I see something like a timeline that's got a really well-defined one strong axis and then the vertical axis is like, we kind of don't care. It just doesn't matter. That there's an opportunity to convey knowledge that is being thrown away, that is being wasted because somebody didn't take the time to actually use that vertical axis for something useful. Lack of axes is a problem. Um, perhaps you've all seen like social network graphs. They look like this because there's not strong axes to find. And uh, I have a whole separate mini lecture that's going to come after the break with me ranting about how uh, social network graphs are usually not very useful and not very interesting and some ideas about how that could be fixed. I thought maybe that'd be good for this, this group. One more thing to remember, axes are negotiable, right? So this is the London Underground map. And uh, it doesn't actually look like London. I mean, it kind of does, but not really. Uh, and it turns out that these tubes are not all straight lines. If you get on a subway and you're going around corners and stuff, um, uh, these corners are not represented well on the graph. And the subways definitely are not making these like 90 degree right angle turns. Um, but when you're on the subway, you're on the car now, and it pulls into a station, what are your choices? Hmm? Stay on the train or get off at the station. Those are your only choices, right? You're on a one dimensional track. And so your choice is basically exit now or maybe some other time. At that level, this map is fine. This is a logical relationship of the subway system. And yeah, it's tweaked to, to more or less represent London also, because you need to know when you're near the zoo or the palace or the gardens or something. But where you, know, where you walk when you get out of the station to get to the zoo entrance, that's a different map. This map is about the subway system. And, and the power, the innovation of this map in the 20s, 30s? I'm embarrassed, I don't know this. Um, uh, Harry Beck's innovation because he was an electrical engineer and he was used to uh, laying things out on circuit boards in these straight lines and 90 and 45 degree angles. Um, that abstraction that he brought to the map was very powerful because it led to a cleaner, easier to understand map. A map that was better suited to this goal of navigating the subway system, which is a different goal than navigating London. So, point is, axes are negotiable. If the axes that you have are not working for you, you can tweak them. You have to tell people that that's what you're doing, but you can tweak them and make them more well suited to what you have to display. Part two of Moritz's uh, two rules for encoding. Color is difficult. So um, at first glance, you say, oh, this map is very simple. It makes perfect sense. The Alps are much hotter than the rest of Europe. Turns out that's not the case. Uh, so this is done all the time. This is an elevation map using a rainbow spectrum of colors, but you'll see this on, um, uh, medical imaging, right? You'll see this on, uh, you know, density of the rock underground where they're going to drill the new tunnel for the, like, this, this, this sort of, this artificial rainbow enco encoding uh, is used all kinds of places. And the problem is, most of the time, I'm not going to say 100% of the time, but almost all the time, it's, um, it's a very difficult encoding to interpret. It's a very misleading encoding. And the problem here is that because color is not ordered in the brain, 
you cannot depend on people understanding which color is greater or more important or more interesting than the other colors. So I understand that it is a physical property in the world, got the physics degree, I understand the wavelength changes, but that's not how we see it. You can't ask somebody to say, okay, blue and orange, which one comes first? There's not a right answer there that you can depend on. In this case, if you say, um, uh, you know, green and teal, someone can kind of look in the, you know, look at the scale and try to figure it out and interpret that, but it's not something that's well ordered in the mind. It's not built in, uh, it's not built into the software that we use. This has also got kind of a weird uh, skew of where the rainbow starts and that the, goes from red to purple and there's just some things that are very difficult about this. The other thing that they've done wrong about this, by the way, is that vertical axis, the high altitude is at the bottom of the scale and the low altitude is at the top of the scale and that's like, you want your mappings to sort of approach approximating reality where you can. That's a situation where they could have made it match reality a little more closely. <clears throat> so, color's not ordered. We've ranted about that. So here's a much better way to map uh, things that are ordered, things that are sequenced. Instead of changing through the rainbow spectrum, you change either saturation or you change intensity. And what that gets you is an ordinal ranking and this is built into the brain. This you can depend on. Someone will say, yes, that is definitely darker than the other one. Now, I can't tell you how much. It's not something that we have quantitative analysis with. I can't say that's twice as bright as that. We're not very good at that. But we're very, very good at saying this is darker, this is lighter, this is more saturated, this is less saturated. <clears throat> so this is an elevation map done uh, almost right, except they, again, similarly have the, um, the vertical axis inverted. Excuse me, my throat's a little sore. I've been talking for two and a half days. Okay, here's a, uh, a permissible, perhaps the only permissible use of rainbow as an encoding. This is, a, this is a temperature map, and I say this is permissible for a couple of reasons. One of which is we have really, really strong cultural conventions around blue being cold, around red being warm, and green being kind of pleasant and in the middle. And <clears throat> Because those conventions exist, because they're very strong, and because this rainbow uh, spectrum is cycled through to the point where the endpoints are at sort of a rational point that matches up, you notice there's no real purple in this, right? That's left out, because we don't, like what temperature is purple? We don't have that. So that's left out of this. And so this is a scale that actually maps relatively well to what our um, cultural conventions around temperature are. The other thing that they did right on this map is that they've got the higher numbers are higher up on the scale and the lower numbers are lower on the scale and they get a gold star for that. The other map, the precipitation map, pardon me, is, um, is actually pretty well done in terms of where there's a lot of precipitation up in Seattle where I live, it's darker. And where there's very little down through the southwest, uh, that bright green is almost entirely absent. The one flaw I would say with this map is that sort of slate background uh, is near enough in some ways to the green that it kind of is difficult to tell when the green is faded completely away. And I think a, a, a background color that was white or some other color where there's a higher contrast would, would reveal a little better when there was no color at all. But that one's actually pretty good. And that's typically what you want to do when you're looking at um, intensity or something, whether it's a, a heat map or a, um, you know, uh, you're, you're accumulating something. Uh, is you do it with a, with a gradient along a single, a single color axis. Color is also very meaningful. There's a, an example that I use sometimes of a um, coursework options for a, uh, it was like an urban design, urban planning uh, coursework at a university in Australia, and all of the courses are this sort of pale blue or pale pink color. And everyone's first thought is like, are, are there different classes for different genders? Like, what's that about? And then they realize that like, the one classes are co-shared with one other department and the other class, like, it's something that has nothing to do with gender whatsoever. And I don't know why they chose pink and blue, but unfortunately what, that ha what, what happens is there's an implication there. And people recognize those colors and say, I know what it means when we put these colors together. And then they try to interpret what they're looking at through that lens. And then they realize they're wrong and they have to unlearn something, and you've just wasted all this time and all this processing power of your potential customer causing them to think they understand, realize that they don't understand, be confused, and then actually try to go back and learn what it is they're, they're trying to understand. So you want to avoid the situation. You want to make things as easy for your audience as you can. And um, uh, the problem with that 
uh, when it comes to color is that there are so many potential associations with, with single colors, with permutations of colors when they're put together, um, that you can, color can have a lot of meaning if you, if that, that, that you don't mean to. So uh, be careful walking through the Irish neighborhood on St. Patrick's Day wearing an orange shirt, right? If, you, uh, if you're traveling in the Middle East, green and white uh, means very, something very different from green and blue. Um, uh, black and white and gray for, for morality, right? Like there's all these, these things that, that have meaning to some people in some situations that do not have meaning to everybody in all situations. And so if you either depend on there being a meaning in that combination of colors or you depend on there not being a meaning in that combination of colors, you're going to get tripped up somewhere. One example here was um, I heard of recently a uh, junior developer and they said, you're going you're gonna to build the dashboard for our system monitor. So the dev goes off and, and comes back a while later and brings up the dashboard and says, here it is. And he brings up the dashboard and everything's red. And the manager's like, is the dashboard broken? Are our systems down? Like, red, that's bad, right? And the dev says, what? Red means good luck, right? Everything's good. Total cultural mismatch. You can't depend on that color being interpreted in a consistent way. So um, be careful. Color is difficult. It's really pretty, though. People want to use color, but it's difficult to get right. Use defaults. Defaults are really powerful. And the reason that we have defaults and the reason that defaults are powerful is because it means you don't have to teach a new language. It means you're using a language that your audience or your customer already knows about. And they can make some assumptions. And if you're using your defaults well, that those assumptions are substantiated by what you're using. And you end up with uh, a shortcut, an intellectual shortcut in terms of getting data into their mind because they understand the mental model you're dealing with. So here's a quick one. <clears throat> Um, this is a map from the New York Times of um, uh, electoral college results from the 2008 election. And um, it's, a, it's a perfectly good map. There's nothing wrong with this map. It's really good if you want to navigate. It's really good if you're talking about real estate or surface area. It's kind of a lousy representation of influence in the electoral college, though. Because what you end up with is you end up with these, these large states, Montana, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, Idaho, where basically nobody lives. Like these are states, four of those five states have the minimum number of electoral college representatives um, because they're very, very sparsely populated. You can't have fewer representatives than they have. On the other end of the country, you have this tiny little peanut here, kind of wedged in between New York and Pennsylvania. It's too small to have a label. That's the state of New Jersey. By itself, it has 15 electoral votes. The surface area ratio is something like 55 to 1 for those five states versus New Jersey. But they're almost on par, right? 15 to 16 votes in terms of electoral college. And it turns out, as a default map, this is a lousy map for conveying electoral influence. Um, but it's a very familiar map. Like, it's a map. What's wrong with it? It's, it's, and, and so the New York Times did something very clever. They made an alternate version. And you can click that little, that little label down off the coast of South Carolina there. And you get this map. And this is a map where each state is not represented by its geographical size, but is built out of squares that represent the number of electoral college vote that that state has. And so this is not a map of geography. It's not a map to navigate. It's a map of electoral influence. And what happens is those enormous states like Montana that have very few votes become these tiny, tiny little, you know, two and three and four pixel wide boxes. And New Jersey, which was that tiny little peanut before, is actually a pretty large powerhouse state here on the East Coast. And now that comparison of 16 to 15 electoral votes uh, becomes much more accurately represented. And in fact, when you're looking at the results of the election, this actually shows more blue than red. Whereas if you're looking at the results of the election based on real estate, based on surface area, um, it's much more difficult to tell where, where the ratio of red and blue is. Um, and in fact, I suspect that there's still quite a bit more red on this map than blue, even though it was a pretty strong Democratic victory in 2008. So, uh, so the, the lesson here is use defaults unless you've got a better answer, right? Unless you've got something that conveys what's interesting or useful about your data in a way that's more compelling than the default format can reveal. Yes? Um, not talking about the red and blue, that's fine. I'm talking about the default, in this case, use of a geographically accurate map rather than an electoral map. Um, so if you use Excel for graphing anything, all the defaults are wrong. Like, I'm not joking. The default colors are wrong. The labels are wrong. The fact that it's in 3D is wrong. Um, like, the fonts, like, everything about the defaults in Excel are wrong. 
uh, because they've never put any care into it. They've never thought about how to make this actually generate a more useful uh, uh, information product. They've made them 3D now, which is wrong, but they haven't actually made them more useful. And so um, whether it's the software default, whether it's using a map because we're doing geodata as the default. I gave a talk yesterday on when not to use maps at a geo conference. Because um, there's a lot of times people say, we've got geo, put it on a map. There might be more interesting relationships that don't actually include that map, right? So it's really, again, this goes back to understanding what you're trying to convey, who it's for, and, and what are the relationships in the data that are most interesting. And maybe geography is not one of them, right? Incidentally, I've got a handful of books here that are going to be going to people who ask good questions. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great question. The question is, um, do you have a rule of thumb for the trade-offs and, and in terms of using a default versus using something innovative? Um, innovation is expensive intellectually, right? If you're going to innovate, you have to invent a new language and you have to teach that language. And then you can, once you've thought of this new language, invented it and taught it to your audience, then you can start talking about your content. If you have a default in place, you've already got that shared understanding and you can talk about your content immediately. So. Um, there's, a, there's a, a higher barrier to success if you're using something innovative. Uh, and so again, the question is, what, how much payoff is there? And I don't, I don't have a standard rule of thumb for that. In that case, absolutely that map benefits by being um, a permutation of an existing thing that we're very familiar with and by being literally shown, like, like on the screen, you click the one button, it shows the one, you click the other button and it morphs back and forth. So um, that one, there's a low cost, relatively, because it's in a context where it's very easy for us to understand what that new map means. But there definitely are situations where an innovative representation um, does not necessarily provide more value or, or the cost is too high. And uh, you know, that depends a lot on your audience, right? If, you're, if you are bringing some new knowledge to fighter pilots or brain surgeons and you know they have to learn it, it's okay to make it more difficult. Um, because once they learn it, they'll become expert users and it may be something they use for their whole career. If it's someone who's like flipping through pages of a magazine and you've got about four seconds for them to say, yeah, I get it, or ah, this doesn't make sense, flip the page, it's a very different challenge, right? And so again, the level of attention that your audience has to expend on understanding matters. So the payoff may be very, very high, but there may be a higher barrier to them understanding as well. So uh, the answer is, it, it depends. I understand that's unsatisfying. So um, we're almost wrapping up the first half of the talk here. Uh, we'll take some questions, we'll have a little break, and then we'll um, dive into the second half. So um, just here's the quick summary. There's some design strategies for uh, uh, successful visualizations. Limit the detail you include. Limit it to the stuff that actually matters, right? Um, use position for your most important relationships. Try different axes. Think about what if this wasn't a time series? What if this wasn't geography? What if we, what if we only show, uh, we show it from most important to least important? We don't care what the time was. We don't care where it took place. Um, that kind of thing. Play with your axes. Do some different things. Um, Yale, is this deck going to be available? Are people going to be able to download this? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to supply it. Just, I see people like madly scribbling these things down. It's like, we'll give you the PDF. You don't have to write this all down. Um, uh, so consider defaults, and, and, and I use the word consider. I don't say use defaults, I say consider, because sometimes defaults are gonna be the right answer and sometimes they're not. Use color for the categories. Colors are great for separate categories, but don't assume that people are gonna be able to get rankings out of them. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, use that table for uh, successfully encoding other data properties. So here's the table again. Um, just a very, very quick overview of, of just a, a small handful. There's many, many, many data visualization tools out there right now. Uh, D3 is a JavaScript library that's excellent, written by Mike Bostock, who, uh, who wrote Protoviz, who's involved. Um, he came out of the um, Stanford Visualization Group and was involved in, uh, I think, Prefuse and Flare came out of that group. So a very, very smart guy. D3 is a, a, a very flexible, very capable, very well-supported uh, JavaScript library that's getting a ton of traction. And it's, it's this sort of, in this magical sweet spot where it provides excellent structure and infrastructure for you to graph what you want and then gives you infinite flexibility with how to represent it. It's really nice. 
processing um, is uh, a little less structured and sort of a little more free form in what it is able to represent easily. It's been described as a sketch pad for data. And so some really beautiful data art that you may have seen in the world, like the um, Aaron Coblin's flight path maps, just showing all the different flights flying from all the airports across 24 hours, uh, was done in processing. And it's a really good language for sort of um, a little more creative, a little more flexible work with data. If you're doing any kind of statistical analysis, R is an open source stats package. Um, and uh, uh, Wickley ha um, Hadley Wickham has written uh, a, a plugin called ggplot2 for doing uh, graphing and visual presentation uh, as an R library. And um, people seem to think that's, that's really good. My understanding, I've not used it, my understanding is that uh, it generates stuff that is, that is very good, but it doesn't look, it's not like presentation quality and then you want to slurp it into another tool and, and, and tweak it and polish up the look a little bit. So those are all um, more or less code-based, free uh, tools, open source. Tableau is a commercial tool. It's a Windows-only uh, desktop tool. There is a, um, a free version of it called Tableau Public, which is somewhat limited in that your data is all public, and they store it for you. You don't have anything privately, locally. But um, Tableau is a really good tool. Like, if you ever wished Excel was more capable and had better defaults um, and was a little bit less frustrating, um, Tableau is, is a really good tool. It has its own moments of frustration, but uh, it's really, really nice um, from my hometown in Seattle. And it's the, it's the analytics and data visualization tool that um, a lot of people are using for, uh, um, for dashboards, um, for interactive infographics in uh, journalistic pieces. You'll see this in um, uh, a friend of mine's done a number of visualizations that have been picked up by the Washington Post in terms of uh, campaign contributions or, or any number of things. It's got uh, maps plugins. It's a, it's a really great tool. So. Uh, that's the end of the first half, um, so let's take 10 minutes. Let's take 10 minutes and come back. Um, yeah? Yes, let's do that. All right, so don't leave yet. Um, we'll take questions. Next segment's, um, uh, I've got a little bit of a boil down sort of series of prompts, which are the questions you want to ask yourself as you're, as you're uh, going through design process. So we can just run through those really quickly. If we had more of a workshop kind of thing, I'd actually have you like take out pen and paper and do that. Um, so we've got uh, a little, a little uh, run through of those. I've got a, sort of a little mini lecture, a dozen slides or so on um, social networks and social network visualization, which I haven't seen done very well yet ever for the most part. And um, finally, another stack of just a whole bunch of, of visualizations. And I mean, I can talk about this stuff all night until my voice gives out. But um, we'll do some questions now. There'll be time for questions later. So let's do a brief round of questions and then have a couple minute break and then resume if you want to come back. Question, go ahead. Oh, um, uh, yeah, if you want to walk up the middle or I can just, I can repeat it into this very sensitive mic that's attached to me. The, the data, yes. right. Yep. Um, and then the thing between those is persuasion, right? There's this bias thing. It's one leg of the triangle, yes. So is, does that mean that anything designed is biased? And if you don't want to be biased, what do you do? Um, I'm going to actually walk all the way through to that slide because it actually is going to be easier to have this conversation. That one. So the question was, there's these three legs, the designer, the reader, and the data that influence what it is that you're creating. And two of these are human, one of these is not. And um, is there necessarily bias? Is there necessarily persuasion in a visualization? Uh, the answer is partially, right? Because anything that a human designs is going to have some choices that were made, some editorial choices. And that's necessarily going to affect the outcome. Now, whether those choices are intended to add bias, right? So whether it's this this right hand leg here, where it's less about the data and kind of more about you talking directly to the audience. That's a more biased or a more, uh, more persuasive angle on things. Um, the other side of it, where it's really about the reader and their connection to the data, it's really on that informative side and you're doing as much as you can to avoid bias. So you're, you're uh, using graph best practices, you're showing the zero on your y-axis, you're citing the source of your data, you're uh, not intending to mislead and, and, and trying to adhere to that. It's more about the data and it's less about your personal opinion or your representation. So um, yes, anything made by a human is going to have some bias. And yes, there are ways that you can minimize that. Uh, and it's a good question. It's a tough question. It's a question that comes up with, uh, particularly in the political season, with 
what is the source of that data? How much of that is truth and how much of that is spin? Um, anytime somebody tells you they're not spinning it, they probably are, right? Um, so uh, it, it's complicated, but um, absolutely efforts can be made to minimize that if, if your goal is not to be biased. Question here? Uh, could you flip to the Canada map for a second? So uh, I have uh, two questions. So one is, um, I really like that plot. I think those colors were selected. They're very vibrant. I didn't pick those colors, for the record. OK, well, whomever it was that picked those colors, I think they did a good job. And so okay. I'd like to know, what are good rules of thumb to try and understand what the right palette is to color a plot like that, such that it does appear very vibrant like that? Ah. And the other question I have is, how do you also do this while taking into account that some people are colorblind, and they might not be able to see a, yes. a green and a red yes. next to each other and differentiate between them? Both great questions. Uh, the best tool for picking a color palette is a website called Color Brewer 2. And I should put that on one of these slides. Um, and uh, color, it's, it's magic. You say, I need, uh, I need five different colors, and I need them to be um, divergent on one axis, uh, you know, uh, go, going up and down from a zero point, or I need them to be separate in color space, or, uh, and it actually was designed exactly for this, for mapping. And you can pick the palette of blues, or the palette of greens, or the, the blue-orange axis, like, you can just pick. So the answer is go to that website and do it. Um, uh, there is also a standard palette of um, 12 colors that are very separate from each other in color space and are also very separate in terms of naming. So that you don't run into questions where you say, it's the light blue, and they say, do you mean the teal or do you mean the sky blue or the robin's egg blue, right? Um, uh, that list is, um, is in this book and is in other places online. And um, basically colors that have been chosen because they are uh, distinct enough that most people can, can differentiate them visually pretty easily. Um, Color blindness is absolutely a thing, particularly with red-green, which is a, a pairing that people want to use all the time. There are ways that you can um, choose shades of red and green so that they are a, a little bit less likely to collide. Uh, I don't know if it's happening down here, but where I live, the, um, the green traffic lights uh, are being replaced with ones that are a little more blue. They've got a little bit of turquoise of a hue going on, and you don't think about it, but when you stop and look, they're a little more blue, and apparently that's uh, separate enough from the red that people who are red-green can, can see that that's got some, some blue in it. So um, I'm pretty sure the color, bluer, color brewer has uh, um, palette choices that you can say is colorblind safe. I know that Tableau has a, a colorblind safe palette. And there's also, I mean, there's other ones. There, there are like red-yellow colorblinds and, and, and other ones you have to watch out for. But those are even smaller fractions. Red-green, I think, is about 7% of the population. Um, so use good tools, use standard references is the answer. And then do you think? Um, textures at all could be useful to fulfill yeah. the same function yeah. if you have to have something in black and white? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, textures are, are a pretty good analog for color in terms of their, their um, you can map like texture density to intensity, but if, you, but if you're not really trying for that, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty good to be able to use uh, separate textures if you're going to be like mimeographing something, right, or black and white photocopying. Um, color's not going to work. Texture is good for that. For sure, and you'll see on the on the visualization properties table, they're actually very similar in what they're good for. Um, not too not not too many occasions these days where we have to design for black and white, but yeah, textures are a really good one for that actually. And you'll see like all the old uh, um, in newspapers and old textbooks, it's you know this is the stippling with the dots, and this is the little left cross hashes, and this is the little right crossed hashes, and this is the vertical stripes, and that's it's a very old technique. It's been done for a long time. I have two questions. The first one is a concrete question about the slide about desktop, mobile, and the tab. And tablet can go to the slide. Yes, this one. Suppose I have like 20 devices, like I want different between different devices, like iPhone, like iPad, iPad, Samsung tablet. So I have 20 of them. Should I also slump them together at 20 curves? Because then it looks very confusing. Is there a better way of visualizing it? That's a concrete question. A more uh, general question is how to visualize high dimensional data. W which data? High dimensional data. Meaning this basically is actually one dimensional data. Yes. So if you have, like the Thai example, you have different features, like the width, the, the categorical width, and the, I don't remember, the other, I think, where there's puncture. Yeah, and foldability and all those yeah, things. How yeah. to visualize, basically, it's for exploration perspectives. Because I think the first part of your talk, I'm mainly focused on presentation. Yeah. Uh, there's some comments on, on on visualizing high dimension data for exploration purposes. Sure. Um, so to answer your first question in terms of how would you, if you have a mobile phone, if you have an iPad, um, that's kind of arbitrary. How you choose to slice that, like is an iPhone mobile or whatever, or, or is the iPad, I, you get to decide. You're the designer, so you get to pick that definition. 
Um, for the second half, uh, second, second question, high dimensional data, that's a really good question and that's a hard problem. And uh, the strategies I usually take are, um, you can get three or four pretty easily onto one graph if you're doing things like an X and a Y and maybe something like a size and then a color for category. Uh, a lot of bubble graphs, you'll see that. And that's, and that's not too difficult. To get beyond that, usually I say slice the data, right? So you might have several graphs that are related but not the same. So they might share an x-axis and then you have different, different categories of the data or, um, or different slices so that it's, it's spread out in space so you're not trying to look at all of those properties all at once. And you might see, uh, you might see some different trends on one graph that is not apparent on another graph um, because they're sliced different ways. Uh, that's tricky and it depends the choice of how to slice it is going to depend a lot on what is the data that you have. And so uh, my advice when, when slicing it is if there are categories or other ways that I know are very discrete, very separate from each other, and I can slice along those lines, um, then you can sort of see them separately. And you might see that each of them has a trend within it, but they may not have correlations with the, with the other. You might also want to slice it in two dimensions so that you can see the trends uh, this way and that way. So across these categories and across those categories, just to make sure you cover your bases. Hi. Um, one just as a follow-up for the color question. Mm -hmm. Color Brewer actually has a really nice R package. So if you're already operating nice, uh, R, R package. package. Yeah. yeah, R Color Brewer. Okay. So it sort of just does stuff magically for you, which is nice. Um, my question is, you talked about uh, sort of the tension between exploration and explanation. Yes. When you're designing a visualization. And so um, it's clear, you know, when you're doing this sort of professionally that it's a life cycle of creating the, uh, a particular visualization, right? Like you don't just get a data set and then produce it and there's some kind of iteration and there's a point at which you sort of transform between the exploration step and the explanation step when you find that aha thing that you want to show. So yeah. I guess part of that must be an art, but if you can talk about some of your process that goes around when, you, when you're doing that. Well, so um, to, to briefly summarize for the recording, uh, how, do you, how do you transition from exploration or the analysis phase to the presentation phase, right? And um, I, guess there's, I guess there's either a predefined definition of somebody says, go find for me what the product that lost the most money was. And so you go and you play with the data and then you come up with an answer and you say, aha, here it is, and you bring that back to show it. So you've got a sort of a, a predefined boundary where you, you know what the success condition is, and then you go find it, and then you, and then you win. Um, or the other end of the spectrum where uh, you're looking, and you're looking, and you're looking, and you see something interesting, expect it or not, and you say, that is noteworthy enough that I want to share it. It's remarkable, right? It's, it's worth remarking about. And, and I'm going to take that piece, that thing that I found. Now, I might want to dig deeper and, and see what the correlations and the causes are, but um, once, you've, once you've found that, that interesting uh, little, little bit of gold in your sand, um, uh, then you've got a story to tell. You've got something to share. Or at least you've got a punchline at the end of it, right? You may not have the whole backstory yet. But it's um, whether or not that you had that coming in or whether or not it was something you discovered, in both situations, you have something you want to share. You have something relevant that's actually worth saying, hey, I need to take some of your time. I want to show you this thing. And then you're going to craft that information deliverable that is, that is separate from all the noise of the analysis that you've been doing. Thanks. Yeah. Hi. Hi. In the big data machine learning field, uh -huh. uh, the visualization, do you deal with graph DB? Does graph DB help you a lot, or you really don't need a troublemaker? I am not familiar with graph DB. I'm sorry. It's not a tool I know, so I don't have, I don't have opinions about it. Yeah, because a lot of people in right now, especially in big data, they very hard to try to deal with put the result persistent with graph DB. Mm -hmm. But then go back like deal with high dimensional data persistent with graph DB still with bigger capacity, lot of lot of other issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm sorry, I haven't used it, so I don't have. Then when you deal with big data, what kind of tool do you use for persistent or oh, what for tool? visualization? Uh, um, D3 is pretty good for visualizing large data sets. It's got pretty good performance. Um, it's JavaScript based. Um, some of the other tools, Tableau, for example, is working on, maybe they already have this uh, ability to point to a Hadoop data set 
So you can sort of take arbitrarily large data and work with it there. Um, I, I don't know enough about uh, the real big data um, representation tools. I, I mostly uh, have worked with stuff that's a little bit smaller scale. So, Thanks for help. Yeah. Do you want a question here in the front? You've been waiting, I'm sorry. Uh, so the question is, uh, one potential lesson from the conversation about colors being difficult is, um, should I be suspicious of legends that are, that are trying to do more than factually represent magnitude, and is that justified? Uh, I think the best thing that you, can, that you can leverage is some critical analysis. And look at what's being represented um, and look at how it's being represented and how it's being marketed, how it's being uh, promoted as this is showing you a thing. And um, see if it makes sense to you, if the level of granularity, if they have uh, citing their sources, that kind of thing. Um, I'm trying to think of a good example of, of one or the other case, and I'm not coming up with anything off the top of my head, but if you've got examples in mind, of, of uh, legends or whatever. Um, I mean, certainly there's any number of things that you can encode, whether it's category, whether it's magnitude, whether it's rank, um, relationship, right? Uh, and those are all valid things to encode and valid things to put into a legend. Um, I guess I would be suspicious when you see color particularly used for quantitative things or ranked things. And there's gonna be some conventions, blue ribbon, red ribbon, white ribbon, or Gold medal, silver medal, bronze medal, right? But those are those are categorical conventions. That's not really about the colors themselves. Yeah. One more here, and then in the mic. Um, that's a good question. The question is, how do you represent things like date and a calendar? Um, short version is, uh, maybe dates aren't the way to organize it. Long answer is, find me at the break or afterwards, and and like get out a pen, and we'll do that. Next question here. Um. In your example for Hipmunk, uh, you provided that how data visualization is really helping in uh, presenting a lot of data elements in, in a particular beautiful graph in here. Yeah. Um, so is there a thumb rule for the number of data elements that should be presented? I mean, is there a maximum um, data element set that should be present in a particular um, graph that you're, or visualization you're doing? And we should not exceed that? Because uh, in many cases, like sales example which you gave, the executives wants to look for a set of data elements. So is there a limit or a thumb rule which you can help us with? Yeah, uh, so the question, uh, is there a limit to the number of, of data elements or data dimensions that you should represent? Uh, three and four is very common. Um, six and seven can be done well, though it takes some effort but I've definitely seen them done well. Um, I naively did some in grad school. I had one of my grad school students um, do a, a, a very nice design. Um, so I'm not gonna say that there's a limit and you should never do more than four or never do more than six. It gets increasingly challenging to add another dimension of data because you've probably already used a lot of your visual encodings. And so to introduce another dimension of data, you have to pick another encoding that is gonna be uh, uh, not, uh, not conflicting with encodings you've already got. So you might not Thank want to you. use color a second time, for example, but you could maybe if you, if you know. So I think with care, you could, you could do uh, more than that. Um, I'm trying to think of examples, and I don't think I can think of one uh, more than about seven. Um, I would probably stop there. Um, and, and again, it gets a little more challenging, but it can totally be done. Yeah, good question. Um, there, are, there are business cards on the back table here uh, for this book, Designing Data Visualizations. And my other O'Reilly book, uh, which is called Beautiful Visualizations. This book is the process. This book is kind of the how to do it, and it follows the arc of the talk pretty closely. The other book is like 400 beautiful color pages of um, examples of all different, it's 20 chapters written by 20 different teams or individuals, uh, case studies of different visualizations that they've done. There's a discount code on the back of the cards. It's the same code on both cards, so you don't need both cards. The code will work for both books. Um, you have to buy it directly from O'Reilly, but uh, if you want the books, that's a way to get them cheap. So th that's on the back table, and I've got some up here. So, um, and there's at least one copy of each book floating around LinkedIn somewhere, and a few copies of the books now in the audience. It's not too late, by the way. There's still two more books for good questions. All right, so this is, uh, like I said, a little rant, um, visualizations of social networks, uh, mostly because we're at LinkedIn, and it's a topic that I've been ranting about for a long time, and it's nice to have a, uh, an audience that I can rant about this particular topic to. So this is um, not just social networks, this is any kind of, of networks, 
So networks of people or other things. Networks obviously made of nodes and links. Networks of people. Uh, the nodes are just people, sort of like so in the green. So um, social networks, how to do it right. Know your data. This is remarkably absent, I think, from a lot of the social network uh, representations that I've seen, where you end up with a map and like, OK, so people know some people. But I know that they know each other, right? Like we all went to school together. Of course they know each other. This is not very interesting. This is kind of the lowest common denominator visualization. And when there's more interesting data available, and we know a lot about the people that are in our data sets, typically. Uh, when there's more interesting data available, it's sort of unfortunate that that's not being leveraged to build anything interesting. So there's all kinds of interesting things. Anybody here at Facebook? You don't have to be shy. Um, so so uh, about four years ago when I signed up for Facebook, I would say, I know Bob. And it would say, how do you know him? And I'd say, we met through a friend. And it would say, which friend? And I'd say, my friend Jane. And it would say, when was that? And, and you'd say, we went to school together. We had a class together. Uh, we dated. Oh, you br did, are you still together? Did you break up? Well, we broke up. Are you still on good terms or not? Like it had this whole questionnaire for every person you added. Now, I'm sure that data is in a, in a, in a, in a backup somewhere. Um, it doesn't prompt you like that anymore. But like, that's a really rich data set. And the visualizations that you could make, and of course, everybody at some point or other has either seen or attempted to draw like the network of their friends or the characters in the TV show who dated or whatever. There's a couple of those actually in this deck. Um, that's a really interesting data set. And so who knows who is, I find, not very interesting. It's minimal. Like that's the, that's the, the least you can show. But all these other questions of what kind of relationship do they have, what groups, what are the geographical affinities that are different from the logical affinities? Who spans groups that they don't, uh, they don't necessarily belong to? Like if, if there's somebody who knows somebody in, uh, in another group? Um, all kinds of interesting questions that could be asked and answered visually that tends to not be. And uh, I think there's great potential there um, for people to, to do interesting work with that. And again, the bottom line, what are the trends, gaps, and outliers? Which is to say, what are the patterns, which is fine, and what are the pattern violations, which is interesting? that we want to be able to see. So start with knowing your data and what's there and what's possible. Second part, once you know that, tell a story. This is an interesting, this is um, uh, Andrew uh, Odewan. Uh, this is from a chapter in Beautiful Visualization. He's talking about um, Senate voting patterns and the connections. Uh, I forget exactly what the threshold is, but there's a connection between two senators when they vote similarly on some some fraction of the, of the Senate votes. And you can see that for the 102nd uh, uh, Senate, um, there was two large partisan clumps. There was a few outliers, like Jesse Helms, um, who are very, very far, uh, in this case, to the right. And there's some very interesting people in the middle. Um, Arlen Specter, Richard Shelby, uh, Bob Packwood from Oregon, who was a, a remarkably consistent Republican consistent in his moral stance, which is to say he was a Republican, he was against abortion, he was also against the death penalty, and also against the Vietnam War. So very moderate in a, in a way that we don't tend to see anymore. And so positions like that put him in the middle um, between these parties. So this is not just which senator is on which party or where are they from, but this tells you something about how they are behaving. And then this is the, the continuation uh, uh, every two years as the new senators come in. And it shows the increasing uh, partisanship in some years and then the diminishing, diminishing partisanship in some other years of the Senate as a body. So this is a very interesting story that's being told. Um, and you can, you can correlate. I don't remember exactly which these years are. I apologize. I think 108th Senate, which you can see is probably the most partisan of these, um, was the year that um, uh, uh, Bill Clinton was in office, and there was the whole Lewinsky scandal and all that, and it was an incredibly partisan time. Uh, I think this was the Newt Gingrich Young Revolutionaries kind of a year. And then things, of course, drifted to be uh, a little less partisan over the next couple of Senates. So fascinating stories that can be told here. This is not a ton of pixels. This is not a ton of deep math to get there. But it's really interesting when you talk about what was going on and put this in a context of what was happening over the course of history at that period of time. So good stories available if you present them well. Uh, and then finally, encode usefully. And then here's the fun examples. I don't know what this show is. People seem to know what this is, some of them. Um, but I saw this and said, this is a layout. There's choices that have been made here that are optimized for aesthetics, but not optimized 
to actually show what's going on. So first of all, there's a couple of different kinds of relationships here. Um, but these are mostly sort of the interpersonal dynamic, and so that's fine. But the layout makes it very difficult to see where something interesting is happening. So I abstracted these a little bit. So the upper half is basically the reproduction of, of what we saw. The lower half, I've sorted the relationship types, where that, whatever that red stripe is relationship is now on the top, and the non-red relationships are on the bottom. And so we can group those a little bit if we want to look at one or the other kind of interaction that these characters are having. But I still find that this is not a very useful uh, not a very useful way of representing these things. So I took one more stab at the layout, and this is what I came up with. And some very interesting things emerge when you can look at it like this. Now you can very quickly say which characters are more uh, heavily involved. You can, you can probably pick which character is the most central characters in the show because they're most highly connected, right? The characters that have connections to uh, every single other or almost every single other character are the more important characters than the ones that are only connected to two or to three other characters instead of to four or to five other characters. Great potential there, um, uh, sort of lost with the original layout. Here's another encoding fail, although the layout is not particularly useful as well, and I point that out because there's uh, some longer lines and some crossings that I just don't think need to be there. You could just put these in proximity and save yourself some ink. But the other issue with this is we're using color to encode all different kinds of relationships, right? Some of these are family. Some of these are whether or not they had a romantic relationship. Uh, some of these are whether they were married, which is sort of a legal thing, which may or may not have any other kind of uh, romantic implication or not. Um, and, and so there's color used for all of them. But we've got other properties and lines. You could have dotted lines, you could have dashed lines, you could have thick and thin lines, you can have lines that are wavy versus straight. You can have arrows on the ends of lines if you have something like a crush or an unrequited love. Uh, and in fact, if you look at um, uh, standard family trees, there's a whole language in, in, in genograms. There's a whole language of uh, visually representing on lines um, things like divorces, things like um, uh, uh, who's alive and who's dead, um, full siblings versus half siblings, uh, all, all sort of the, the genetic relationships. And then there's a whole other layering of that in terms of the emotional relationships, whether it is, it is close or it is distant, whether it is positive or negative, uh, whether there's been uh, abuse of some kind or other. All those visual representations exist. There is a language, although it's not a very commonly used one. Um, and again, this is sort of this, this, this failing here is this lowest common denominator where I can't even tell I can't even say color means this was a romantic thing and a dotted or dashed line means family, right? I have to go back and look at the, at the, uh, at the legends to understand what every one of these means. And there's, there's nothing that the encoding itself tells me about the flavor of data it is used to represent. So we're, we're sort of overloading color by using it to represent many different dimensions of data rather than simply one. Here's a, a very different layout. Uh, this is from a website called They Rule, which is a website for exploring um, political influence of um, individuals and corporations and the flow of money. And uh, it, you can't see, I apologize, um, that table, that's the board, right? People who sit on the board, that middle one is J.P. Morgan Chase. This is a few years old now. Uh, there are some board members around that table. They sit on the next outer ring of boards, and then there are other shared board members. And, and what this is showing is that there's a very small network, a very intimate network, of a relatively small number of individuals who sit on the boards of uh, a very high number of very influential companies. And that so if you have uh, the Fortune 500, you don't have 500 unique non-overlapping boards of directors. You have a very small number of individuals relative to those number of companies. And these very small number of individuals actually wield a disproportionate amount of political power. So that's what the graph is showing. And they could have done just something like a force directed graph where this was just sort of allowed to become one of those knots, kind of like if you looked at just one of the Senate parties, um, where there was no real meaning to the spatial placement. This doesn't really have an X, Y axis, but it has a radial um, axis that, that, that makes quite a bit of difference, where the center is this, this uh, J.P. Morgan Chase board, and then the further you get from that, you're further from that particular locus of influence, but, um, but it gives some nice arrangements so that it's easy to understand what, uh, where some of these players fall in the grand scheme of things. So I just thought that was uh, a nice use of encoding to sort of tell the story with a little bit more clarity. Question? I'm sorry? For the win. Yes, intentional layout for the win. They're, they, they are improving the quality of their presentation by um, having some intentionality in, in how they've chosen to represent this. So. Uh, if you're designing 
social network graphs or graphs of any other kind of network, uh, use axes, man. Make your placement count. It's really powerful. Use it to actually convey some knowledge rather than just doing an arbitrary force directed graph and uh, letting it go with that. So here's the process. It's time to visualize something. You've got a database, you've got a dump, you've got a blank sheet of paper in front of you. What do you do? How do you start? This is a hard process. I wrote this book uh, because I didn't know how to do it. So this is, this is the process that, that you go through to actually get something onto the page. Um, like there's nothing in the world more intimidating than a blank sheet of paper, right, or a blank screen. And uh, like I find my creativity doesn't sort of just originate spontaneously. I have to go through a little bit of process to get things flowing. So this is the process. So the question is, what do you want to show? But that's not really specific enough. Really, the question is, what questions are you trying to answer? And that's pretty good because that points you to some kind of data that you can actually supply. But really, what you're talking about here is what actions or decisions are you trying to enable? And that's going to lead you to questions. And that's going to lead you to what you want to show. And so when you're looking at data and saying, well, which one of these do I put on the page? That's a hard question. But if you're saying, what decision am I trying to make with this data? Where to invest money? Um, uh, which food processor to buy, which bike tire, these kind of things. That will help you by informing you, by telling you which data matters and which ones to put on the page. Who's consuming the data and what are their needs? These are fundamental. If the person who's consuming the data is not you, you have to think about them a little bit. You have to do some research, potentially, to understand what it is that they're going to need for them to be happy. So what are their priorities? What are their biases? What are their limitations? Limitations, again, is, is things like how much resource do they have? How much time do they have to look at these? Um, what don't you know about them? This is sort of a hard meta question, but there may be things you, you know very specifically. I actually don't know what desktop OS they're running. That might make a big difference. I don't know whether they're on mobile or they're on desktop. That might make a big difference in how I present this data. So these are things that if you're aware, you don't have a good answer to. You can either go find that or you can um, you know, design something that works in either situation. What data dimensions do you have to play with? So this is things like the tire size, whether it's puncture resistant, price, all those kind of things. Um, and this gets back, again, like I said, a little bit towards something that looks a lot like a database spec. where You've got the different fields and the different properties of the fields. So what types of data do I have? Once I've listed the data that I have, what kind of data is it? Is it categorical? Is it ordinal? Is it quantitative? Is it relational? And then location. Location is complicated, right? Because location could sort of be ordinal. It could be uh, uh, ranked or not ranked. It's probably categorical at least. It could be positional if you're plotting an XY. So location's complicated, but it's uh, another a flavor of data. What are the key relationships? Probably. I say probably because um, Often the first instinct is a good instinct, but it's not right. And so you think you know what's interesting or you think you know what's important, and you go in and you're going to answer this question, and you get there and there's nothing interesting there at all. And you on the way sort of saw this one other thing that caught your attention, and so you start to go chase that down. And the relationship that you thought was interesting is really boring, but this other thing was emergent and you didn't know about it beforehand. So the key relationships are the ones you think are probably going to be key, but you can't be sure. Once you've identified what you think the key relationships are, what's the data that you need to represent those? From the set, right? Because you've got a lot of data, and you're going to pick a smaller fraction of it to represent visually. Um, what, what's required for that? And then so here's an example statement, right? Show the relationship between A and B, potentially expanding to C, across X or across X and Y from M to N. So you've got some data. You've got some boundaries. You've got some relationships. And which, what are you actually going to do with that data, right? Um, what, what is the data points that are actually called for in that spec? So this spec needs A and B, or maybe C. It needs some X. It needs M to N. So that's told us this is the fraction, this is the subset of all the data in the world that I'm going to look at today for this project right now. We can get rid of the other data, or at least set it aside for the moment. So now we're getting into actually putting stuff on the page. How can you use position? to reveal the key relationships. So I gave a talk um, yesterday at the WARE conference, which is all about maps and geo, about when not to use maps. And I gave that talk because it's really, uh, just like it's easy to just push the graph button in Excel or make a pie graph, it's really easy to say, we've got geo data, let's plot it on a map. And um, I put up a couple of really interesting examples of, of location data or data that had location as an aspect to it, where location was not the most important thing. 
It was not the most interesting thing. And if we'd use two dimensions of map data, two dimensions of spatial placement, to put the data on a map, that's those two dimensions that I can't use for other things. And instead, uh, there's an example from the New York Times that has timeline and then a vertical grouping as a category. And that was really powerful and really interesting. And then there was a color code for the continent. That was fine. We didn't need to like zoom into the city where something took place. That was less interesting than the place in history and this category. So um, understanding what the key relationship is, thinking about ways you can place it. And is there a good default format or not for this kind of relationship? If there's a good default format, consider it. Don't have to buy it and put a 30-year mortgage on it, but rent it maybe. See if you like it. Try some other things too. List some different combinations of axes that might give you different kind of insights. List some that you're pretty sure are not going to work and plot them out anyway just for fun, just to see what you get. Um, because uh, by definition, the, the data or the relationship that you don't know exists, you're not going to be able to plan a format that it's going to reveal, right? You're going to stumble onto it accidentally. So uh, list some different things, some versions. Once you've decided more or less what your axes are going to be, what your spatial placement is going to represent, then you want to do things like uh, pick the other varieties of encoding that you're going to use for the other data factors. So these are maybe not your most important data dimensions, not your key relationship, but some related ones that you'd like to then put on the page. And pick good encodings for that, again, using something like that table. See how it looks. Maybe it's terrible. Maybe you, maybe you use size when you should have used shape, or you use shape when you should have used color. Mix it up. Try something different. Um, uh, I've been doing this a long time, and my first instinct is usually not right anyway. It's close, right? But, but the data in my mind is not the data on the page. And I put it on the page, and, uh, and it looks different than I had imagined it. It's not as satisfying. I say, ah, oh, it's not actually going to work the way I wanted. I'm going to mix it up a little bit. It's, it's way more variable than I thought, or it's not nearly as variable as I thought. Let's do this differently. So at the end of the day, iterate a lot. Show some people. Ask for advice. Take it down the hall to someone who knows nothing about your data and say, what do you think of this? Does this make sense? And um, like, that's like the, the super budget usability testing, right? Just get opinions from somebody who doesn't already have an opinion about it and see what they think of what you've got. Um, that's all I got. If there's more um, questions or thoughts or comments, uh, we can dive into that. Or for heaven's sakes, it's after six, you can go home and that's fine too. Um, but there's still two books to give away if there's more good questions. <laughs> Thank you. Question. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> Is there a good way of going about testing that? Right. So you mentioned iterate and go, you know, down yeah. the hall and ask, you know, somebody who hasn't seen it, but. You know, you'd think that the people who made those went through at least some of those steps themselves. So is there a, a, a good prescriptive way to go about testing a visualization that you've created? Um, is, so the question is, is there a good way to go about um, testing the visualizations? Honestly, when you say, I think they probably did that, I think they probably didn't for a lot of them. I think, um, unfortunately, a lot of the bad examples, which is to say most of what you see out in the world, uh, they're not designed very intentionally to be a useful information product. They're either, um, they're either designed to be visually interesting, which is different than being useful. Uh, like those last two ones I showed are very pop culture, right? There's not a lot of, 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 of uh, depth of consideration and depth of data rigor that goes into those. They're fun. And that's fine. Like it's, it's fully legitimate to be fun. And I picked those as examples because, because they can be improved fairly easily, um, but also because they're kind of interesting and, and people are willing to engage with them a little bit more. Um, uh, so, so I think a lot of them are not tested, honestly, and I think even a little bit of testing is useful. But in terms of a metric, like, like three people, right? Get three people who don't know anything about it or don't know much about it, and if two of them say the same thing, wait, what's this about? I don't understand this part. Then you go back to the drawing table. If they're sufficiently representative of your audience, right? If you're gonna, if you're, uh, you know, gonna show a performance of different car sales and you're only gonna show it to people who sell automobiles and you take it to the butcher shop, they might not get it, right? That's fine if they are not your target audience and you're very clear on that. But if your target audience is uh, generalizable but not the people in the cube next to you, trying to get someone who's more or less in that domain, um, if you can, is, is gonna be useful. There's, I mean, there's industries dedicated to 
uh, running those tests, finding those people, et cetera, for you. That's a sometimes expensive and, 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 and uh, painful process. But um, you, can, you can do it cheaply with a little bit of selectivity. And yeah, I mean, I think, I think um, it's absolutely valuable. It absolutely does not need to take a lot of effort. And I think most people don't do that. Because they look at it and they say, oh, it makes perfect sense. I get it. Bob, who sits in the cube next to me all day, every day, he's been looking over my shoulder for two years, gets it. It makes perfect sense. Um, and, you know, it's one more thing to do, right? It's more effort to expend. So uh, it's not done enough, I think. I have a sort of businessy question, I guess. You know, you're sort of preaching to the choir here, I would assume. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't quite hear you very well. Uh, so, I see you're sort of preaching to the choir here, I would assume. Yeah. We're all data people. I hope so. Um, in terms of the market for analytics, it seems like there's still a big hurdle to overcome. Like, there's a lot of companies that are developing analytics-based products. Yes. Um, but I haven't seen any of those really hit the rocket you know, hit the sort of proverbial rocket ship, um, in large part probably because they don't do this well enough. Yeah. Um, what do you see as sort of the market for analytics-based products in the next couple of years? I, I, uh, I see it really booming. So there's a, um, O'Reilly has a conference called Strata that's held twice a year. Uh, it's in the spring down here, just happened in February, and it's in the fall in New York. And that conference is like one year old, and it is booming, right? Thousands of people show up. And it's a, it's a conference about big data and about what you can do with it. And uh, I think there's sort of been this, this need, this unrealized potential, because we're accumulating data really quickly, right? Really quickly, more and more data than we've ever had before, orders of magnitude, literally, over, over small numbers of years. And you, th the data is worthless unless you can analyze it, unless you can get into it. So I think the market is only going to increase, I think, um, tools related to managing data, but absolutely tools for understanding data, I think that market's going to increase dramatically. Um, there are some companies that have been around a little while, Tableau and, and, and um, Spotfire and some others that, that, that are, are sufficiently well established that they're going to do really well, I think. I think there's still lots of room for new tools, uh, e e either niche tools. Uh, so there's a company outside of Seattle called TechBot that's a Boeing spinoff that does visualization just for aerospace. Um, but, but I think there's a lot of room both for, for good general tools, um, since I don't think that really has been satisfied yet, and, uh, and absolutely for specialized tools if there's an industry or a particular angle that there's uh, room for. Anyone who's got data is going to need to figure out what to do with it, or it's worthless. Yep. More questions? Anybody? One here? It'd be so cool if we were actually taught this. Yes. Uh, the question is, is, is any good data visualization education happening at the K through 12 level? And my suspicion is not at all. Um, like, uh, I, don't think it's, I don't think it's happening well at any level. And I think visualization as, as a field, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's, it's been incredibly gaining in popularity over the last couple of years. When I started doing this work in 2004, you know, there was like three blogs and like, one or two companies that were kind of doing anything related to it. I mean, a little more than that, but it, it was not much. And um, every year, the number of people who are interested, the number of blogs, the number of tools, the number of examples you see in the world is increasing radically. Uh, any sort of actually broadly applied education around this, I think would be awesome, but I haven't seen it yet. Um, but I think, it, I think there's potential there, because the, the more of these that people see and the more accessible tools there are, um, the more people want to try their hand at it. I mean, it's, it's one of the many uh, outgrowths of having desktop computing power, right? Um, so, uh, and, and, and there's a lot of pop culture accessibility. Uh, in election year, all the graphs of that, um, uh, the World Cup soccer, uh, was it, uh, I forget what year it was, um, there was great, incredible, complex visualizations of like which of the 64 teams was playing which other team in which stadium on which day in which neighborhood. Like really, maybe it wasn't 64 teams, but like there was these very complex diagrams going on. And, and, and it was fun. And people who wouldn't think of themselves as being numbers people, but who were sports fans, got really into it, right? And so you see that and you think, oh, I could do that. Or I want to do that. And so the demand is increasing, certainly. Um, Trickling down to K through 12, I, I would love that. Like, that would make me really happy. Uh, I think that's a few years off still. But um, uh, none of the stuff I've talked about is really hard. It's just unfamiliar. It's an unfamiliar way of thinking. But, you know, that was an hour, and you guys have got a ton of information. So there's good potential, I think. Somebody has to prioritize it, though, which is harder. 
Any more? Hey. One more. I was just wondering, what do you think is the most challenging hurdle to overcome in better analyzing and visualizing data, and how do you overcome it? Great question. Uh, do you, um, uh, most challenging hurdle um, in analyzing and visualizing data, do you mean in terms of uh, personally when you've got the blank page in front of you? Or do you mean in the industry? Oh, I meant personally. Personally, when you've got the blank page in front of you. Um, I, think, I think the hardest part that, that is often uh, the most overlooked and the least well treated is that contextualization in terms of the audience. Because uh, it's a way of thinking that, uh, that, that we're not taught very well. And uh, the, the encoding stuff, um, I don't want to say it's an afterthought. It's core. It's important. Uh, but but um, it, it, it's, it's very heuristic. Like that's a solved problem, more or less. We know how to do that well. And there's been books and there's been research in the cognitive psychology that's going back decades. Like we know that people are very sensitive to things like length and less sensitive to things like curved paths in terms of what we can, uh, you know, how much visual discretion we have. Like we, we've known all those answers for a long time. Some of the tools like Tableau do a really good job of good defaults with those. That's a solved problem. The hard part is, is the squishy part, the human part of really understanding who is this for, how do you satisfy them effectively, what are their needs? And uh, th that is not addressed well, and that's a very hard thing to build a heuristic into your tool for. Like, that's, that's, still, that's still in the human domain. And um, uh, my particular perspective is because I accidentally went to graduate school uh, I intentionally went to graduate school. I intentionally went to graduate school for user experience, which is this study. I wanted to design interfaces. I wanted better solutions that serve people well. The accidental part was getting into data visualization. So I already brought this awareness of who is my audience, who is the customer that I need to satisfy with this informational product. Uh, I brought that with me um, when, I, when I started doing visualization work. Most of the visualization work that I've seen, uh, they're sort of the one end of the spectrum of the pop culture, graphic design-y stuff. And the other end is like stats, big data, uh, computer graphics, and it's, it's really rich, interesting, deep intellectual work, but it's also separated from the utility that it is, that it is attempting to satisfy sometimes, right? It's all about tools and not about solutions. And um, I think that's a cultural gap that, that is closing. And uh, um, I think there's a lot of factors that, that's going to bring that. Um, I think the biggest one, honestly, has been Apple. Apple's success over the last decade has made people sit up and listen to design and listen to the fact that paying attention to your audience matters. Because for decades before that, you say, look at Microsoft. They hate their customers. And look at how rich they are. Look at IBM. They've never done anything nice for anybody. And, and nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. They're absolutely a sure, a sure thing, successful, right? And that doesn't fly anymore. Now you actually have to provide a better experience. And so people are waking up to that. People are, are um, I mean, look at Hitmonk. It's beautiful, right? Like, I use Kayak for years, and it's a great tool. And Hitmonk is hands down way better. It doesn't have as many airlines. Uh, it's, not a, it's not as comprehensive. It's absolutely a better tool. It's absolutely a better experience because it's so much more satisfying to use. And people are starting to wake up. Business and technology is starting to wake up to the fact that your customer matters, and you have to make them happy. And that is a good way to, to get ahead. Um, so I think that's more of a cultural limitation than, than any kind of a technological challenge. Uh, and it's changing, but um, it'll take a while still. We'll get there. Thanks. Thanks. And can you also touch on, if people don't have other questions, I was also curious about the, the other half about the industry, like what challenges. I'm the, sorry, the other half about? The other half of the question about the data, what challenges the data visualization industry is, is facing? Yeah. And in, in what you see for the coming years? Um, so um, I, I guess I sort of got both of those conflated a little bit in my answer, that, that both on an individual basis and as a, as a uh, as an industry, designing for an audience is, is, a, is, is more challenging than getting the technology right. Um, most places also don't have the technology right, for the most part, Excel being the example, or these other tools that are uh, either have poor defaults or are sort of blind to that end usage, right? The points are on the page, we're done, right? And, and the answer is no. You've, you've shown that you can put points on the page. Let's put the right points on the right page with the right colors and the right layout. And um, so that's the algorithmic encoding layer. And then who is it for, right? is the other layer. So I think both on an individual basis, being aware of it, and, and uh, culturally, industrially, having tools that support that is, is, the, is the next big things. Thank you. Thanks. Oh, let's be done. It's late. I'll post the link uh, <laughs> to, the, to the talk. Uh, let's say check back tomorrow on the LinkedIn event, and I'll post the uh, link to where you can download the uh, slide decks for the talk uh, and the instructions for the video streaming in case you want to forward it to your colleagues. Uh, and with that, let's thank Noah again. <laughs>